Uh, back. This is the start of session three of the Multimedia and Music Miniconf. Uh, kicking off the session will be Joel talking about a better conference recording system, um, followed a bit later by Jim Cheatham giving us an introduction to a music programming language and a couple of lightning talks. So we'll switch the video over and on to Joel. OK, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to give a talk today. Instead of sitting behind the camera, I'm going to stand in front of the camera and actually talk about what we do behind the camera. So who am I? I'm a software systems aerospace engineer who really likes open source software. And thanks to people like Clinton up the back there, I got involved with some conferences. And thanks to Matt, I'm now doing AV stuff. So why am I doing this talk? Well, I really like in volunteering at conferences in AV. So I've done PyCon for the last two years and LCA last year and this year. And that has involved training people in AV, actually setting up the venue, so all the setup you see in the rooms each year at a different conference. And I also managed to write an encoding system at the last PyCon, and that's what I'm going to talk about towards the end of this thing today. So what I'll look at, so I'll give you a brief overview of what we've done for AV systems in the past where I've been volunteering. We'll look at what I'm proposing for a new encoding system, as well as talking about some of the stuff that's been done already. And then I'll briefly mention how you can get involved if you're interested in this type of thing. So the past AV setup at our various conferences run by Linux Australia has been a custom combination of hardware and software that is often thrown together at the last minute, thing, which really delights the conference organizers, I know. Um, so basically, there's a whole lot of hardware that's been shipped around to each individual conference. And we have a fairly standard software setup we use, luckily. And it mostly works, but there's always something that goes wrong. But we'll get to that. So let's have a look at what this hardware actually is. So if we look at this diagram, we have up here a, well, at the front of the podium, we've got a speaker. And that speaker is probably going to be giving some slides. So we need to be able to capture that. Uh, we've also got a camera, which is recording the speaker who's giving the talk. And we've got an audio source of some sort. Sometimes we've got multiple cameras. So in our keynote room, we normally have a wide angle shot as well as one focus on the speaker. So that's all hooked up in this sort of interesting configuration. Uh, in the past, what we've done to capture the speaker's laptop is use a device, which is this little um, box in here, which is called a Twimpact. Now, we need to be able to capture the output coming out of their laptop, which in the past has all been VGA-based output. And we need to capture that, feed into our system, as well as feed it out to the screen. So these twin pack boxes has done that very nicely for us in the past. But it's captured that in a format that we can use. Then we've got in the room, we have three laptops. So there is one laptop that is has someone sitting at it the whole time during a talk. And that person is in live time mixing the talk. So as we speak, someone is sitting up there mixing this talk. And that's being recorded out to disk and possibly being live streamed. We then have another laptop at the front of the room connected to our twin pack, which is capturing the DV source from that and sending it back to the mixer. And from our camera, we've also got another laptop connected to our wide angle shot, for example, that's feeding that DV source to our mixer. Then finally, we've got an audio mixer, which normally takes the output of the main room audio. And we feed that into our mixer as well through another box. So that's the hardware. But what software are we using? So thanks to Plug, uh, we have a system called Event Streamer, which I've used now a couple of times. And it's very, very nice. So what does it let us do? First, it lets us do configuration of the conference and the venue. So 
Within a conference like this, we have five or six rooms. In each room, we've got our three computers, let's say, to do all of our mixing and streaming between the um, different devices. So we've got one interface that we can go to through Event Streamer, where we can configure a room to have X, Y, Z devices, give it a different role. So that might be um, capturing the audio or capturing the um, twin pack stream or whatever it might be, or the actual mixer itself. So we configure that all up, and then it knows where to send all the individual video streams to the mixer laptop. We've also got a station monitor. So on each individual machine, we've got a monitoring interface so we can see exactly what services are up, and hopefully we can go and restart them if we need to. And the good thing about the conference management tool is that we can actually see the status of every single device in every single room. So when something goes wrong, someone sitting in a managed uh, in the network operation center or wherever they may be, they can just push a button and hopefully fix that entire room's system up. And I've used that a few times. Then we get to the actual mixing and recording. So We've done that in the past using a tool called DV Switch, and we're still using that today. So basically, that is a little software tool that takes all the different audio and video input streams and allows you in real time to mix and match the different streams to generate a talk that you actually see. So if any of you have watched a talk from one of these conferences, that's how it's done. And then. At some point, we have to actually take the raw video that we've dumped out from the recording and encode that into the different formats. So that might be MP4 or OGV or whatever it is. So we use FFmpeg for that normally. So that brief overview probably sounds pretty good. Yep, I agree. It works pretty well. Like we've done multiple conferences with it. Uh, it's helped us out a huge amount. But there's a few issues that we keep running into. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them. So the hardware. The twin packs, as I mentioned, the twin packs grab this lovely feed from the presenter's laptop and gives it back to us in DV. But it is only supporting VGA input. And as you might know, VGA is still supported, but it's not very good if you want high definition video. And it's got Firewire output, which is great. It works well. But where are we going to plug it into a modern laptop or box? Because I'm not sure about you, but I haven't seen a modern laptop with a Firewire input recently. The other thing is the laptops that we actually use. So they were all bought a few years ago. They were old then, and they're getting older now. And they're running out of time. We've had to retire quite a few of them, and I'm not sure how long, much longer they're going to keep going. Now, on the software side, we've got similar issues. Now, DV switch is great. It lets us mix everything we want. But it needs libAV. Now, libAV works perfectly well. But for the combination of DV switch and libAV, uh, well, neither of them are actually supported anymore properly. So for example, at PyCon last year, we were running all of our laptops with Ubuntu 13.10, because that was the only platform that we could actually get DV switch installed and a libav compiled for the right versions. Somehow, for this year, we've actually got, at this conference, Ubuntu 15.10 with DV switch running. Uh, that's thanks to someone from Debkov actually coming and fixing it up for us. So we can't really rely on that. So what can we do to overcome these problems that we've had? I, I don't really like getting in and having to fix all these problems up the day before the conference, and it always seems to happen that way. But it pull, gets pulled off somehow. So version 2 that I'm proposing. Now, version 2 to me is a combination of existing hardware and software, as well as some new stuff that we're playing around with today. And I'll get to that. So for me, having been involved a little bit, I have three main focuses for this project. So the first one is make it simple. So I'm not sure if any of you have looked at the event streamer sources or um, looked into hooking all the stuff up. But while event streamer is really nice, I don't actually understand much Perl. And so I spent 
probably two weeks looking through and trying to translate all of that into Python so I could learn what was happening along the way. Um, I've learned a huge amount about that all now, but um, it's not really easy for other people to get into. And there is sort of no comments in the code, so it was a lot of guessing. Uh, which leads on to the well-documented part. Now, well-documented here is not just things like comments and code or having the code in some language that I can understand because I want other people to get involved as well. To me, this is actually about setting up a conference. So if I want to run AV at a conference and I've never done it before and no one else is around, how can I do that? Well, hopefully you could just go to some website with some documentation and read it and it'll tell you exactly how to do that. And then potentially we could add in stuff like training for volunteers, which I'll get to later. And the last part is the monitoring. So EventStreamer has pretty good monitoring in place. We can see exactly the status of all the different devices. But when we got to the actual encoding, because the encoding script, the original one was very rush job. It worked, but it was not very good. In terms of monitoring, there was none. Um, so I've built a bit into the new system that I'm going to talk about, but I'd love to have a huge amount more so we can see exactly what's happening at all points in time. So, as with the existing setup, these are the sort of main components that I see we need. Something to do with the conference setup. So Event Streamer is really good for that and it already does it, so we might just need to modernize it a bit or something like that, but it's effectively all there. Then there's the recording, which includes the mixing. So we need something to replace DV switch and I'll get to that in a minute. Encoding, well, the single bash script was great, but let's do something a little bit better. And I've done a little bit of work on that, so I'll talk about that and show you something that's been done. And then finally, we've got the distribution. So we need to be able to upload this stuff to YouTube. Like, so for most of these conferences, we aim to have it done the next day. That's hard. We have to go through all the videos and review them all and get them up. So by having a good encoding and distribution thing that's all automated, we can get that done a lot easier. So, recording. Now, there's two parts to the recording. Obviously, there's the hardware and the software. So, talking about the hardware first, it would be great if we could move to something as we're trialing at this conference where we actually have it all HDMI input. So, or potentially USB-C in the future. It is fairly new, but we'll see. Uh, so the question was, are we going to get rid of VGA entirely? Well, no. At this conference, we've got VGA supported um, via adapters. But the main thing is that the hardware that we're capturing it all from is HDMI based. So that means we've got all the digital video and high definition digital video coming out. So that makes it easier for us in the recording. Whether the input to that is VGA or HDMI, that can vary. But at least we've got the HDMI support, which is more than we had before. Yep. Are, you, are you going to be taking audio off of HDMI? Uh, are we going to take audio over HDMI? At the moment, the boards don't do that. Um, but hopefully, we will be able to get to that in the future. So this, um, I'll talk about it now, the Nomado Opsys boards. Um, so you'll see a couple of them around the rooms. We've also got some of the Atlas boards. So Tim Ansell has done a whole lot of work around developing an open hardware spec for this HDMI video capturing. And he's done a lot of work on that. He's currently working on it as we speak because there are always little bits that are coming up that aren't quite working or something like that. So we're getting them deployed live time sort of thing. Um, and it's working pretty well so far. We haven't had any problems in this room today. And I can't come in on the other ones, but I haven't heard anything. So that's going well. But there needs to be a lot more work done on that. So this is a version one product. It is working pretty well, but we need to do more work on that. So if you're interested in doing um, the hardware aspect or good at FPGAs or things like that, then Tim would love to talk to you and I'll tell you where to find him. On the software side, if we're going to get rid of DV switch, we need to replace that with something else. So the other thing that we want to do is uh, DV switch is standard definition and because it's running on DV. Let's move to something that's fully high definition ready. 
and the answer I thought to that was going to be another of Tim's projects, which was called GST Switch. So it's using GStreamer in the background to manage all the different streams and then mix them all together. But there was no UI. Uh, that's a bit hard. If I'm sitting in front of something mixing, I sort of want to see what I'm generating rather than just guessing wildly what's coming out. So there's the group in, from Germany, the KS Computer Club, and they've got a video operation center group as you can see there. And they've come up with a program called Voctomix. And we're actually going to be using that for this conference as well. So it will look much the same as DV Switch if you've ever seen it. It's got all your different video sources and an audio source. And it will mix them all and output them as you would with DV Switch. Now, it is pretty early. It works fairly well from what we've seen but it does take a lot of resources. So they're setting it up using a i7 box with huge amounts of RAM and whatever else. At our conferences, we just have laptops and they don't quite have i7s. So we've actually got a couple of the laptops that we've rented to do the mixing this time, but is that what we want to do going forward? I'm not sure. So we'll have to look at that project and see whether we can submit some enhancements to it and work with them to enhance that for us and hopefully help them out as well. So the next part, which I'm going to spend a bit more time on, is the encoding. So I want a system that is simple to configure. I want it to output whatever different formats I want. As I mentioned, I want it to be really well monitored and I want it to be scalable. So if we have a lot of different videos that we need to encode at once, I don't want one box doing it. I want lots doing it. Otherwise, we'll never get them done for the next day. So I'll come back to encoding in more detail very soon. Distribution. So as I mentioned, we need to be able to upload these to different places. At the moment, we can upload them fairly well from our system that we use at PyCon, but all it is is a little script that sits there one, running, watching for new files to appear in a directory. And as soon as it finds it, it goes and looks up stuff based on the file name and then uploads it to YouTube. Um, that works, but I'd like it to be a little bit better so that I can actually see exactly when something got uploaded to YouTube and what's being uploaded to YouTube and stuff like that. The other thing I'd like to do is rather than having to stick all of the videos onto a USB drive and send them down to someone at Linux Australia to upload to the mirror, I'd like to just go there automatically. So we'll see if we can get to something like that. I'm not holding my breath on that, but we'll see. And this is not a component, but something that I really want to push is to have really good documentation. So we need to go through and make sure that as much of the system, if not all of it, I hope it's all of it, is documented in really, really good detail. So I want this to be really simple for someone to set up. So I want the conference organizer to go, oh, yep, you're using that system, great. We are just going to deploy that, and we know it's going to work straight away because I've been at a number of conferences now where the organizer's going, so is the video ready yet? And you go, maybe, and it's not. And the night before, everything breaks. So let's have it really simple. The other thing I would like to do is be able to give tips to the conference organizers and the AV coordinators on how they can train their volunteers to do AV. So yesterday, for example, we had an AV volunteer session. And that was good. We got to show everyone exactly how to use the software, how the setup worked, and stuff like that. But that's an hour or two out of the organizer's day that they have to do to go and train all these people when they're trying to madly set up the conference. And some conferences, you don't actually have those two hours before the day. Like for PyCon in 2014, we got in on the morning of and had to set it all up in about two hours. So if you're trying to train people on the system in the venue as well, that's just not going to work. So if we can have a website that we can point people at, and it could have training videos as well as different um, images and guides and explanations on how to do everything. It'll make everyone's life a lot easier. So encoding. You'll probably notice I've mentioned encoding a bit. And the reason is because at PyCon, 
well, just before and actually during PyCon last year, I was sitting in a room writing an encoding system. So I had help from another person doing a lot of the actual video encoding, so thank you, Kimberly, for that. But there was also a lot more that we didn't realize we hadn't quite got working. So Friday morning, yep, the conference started, and I'm sitting there writing code. And I wasn't really happy with that <laughs> because I wanted it working. Anyway, the good thing is that it was finished, and by the end of Sunday night, which is when the talks finished, we had the first video coming out. So it wasn't quite next day, but all the videos were out by the end of the conference. So being a Python conference and the fact that I quite like writing lots of stuff in Python, um, this new encoding system is written in Python on the back end, and it's got a web front end, and that's Angular, and I'll show you that very soon. As for the actual encoding, we get people to review talks and stuff like that, and then we have all these nodes that go off and do all the encoding of the different jobs. And thanks to one of the other volunteers, we now have a Docker image of the actual encoding system. So we had all of these laptops set up doing the actual encoding, and other people brought their own laptops around. So thanks, Clinton, for your really fast laptop, because we got a lot done on that laptop, as well as all the others, and managed to get it all done by the end of the conference. So how does encoding actually work within this system? So the first thing we do, as with the conference here as well, we take the talk and while the talk is going, the person is recording and mixing and stuff like that, and they're writing down little notes about what's actually happening. Um, basically, we know from the conference schedule that a talk starts at this time and goes at that time, so we go and look for all the video files for that talk and match them up to the talk. So a reviewer has to sit there and go, yep, all these files are included in that talk. And then they have to configure a few other options that I'll show you in a minute. After that, they can actually say, yep, this is all the information for that talk, so we'll go and submit that to be encoded. And one of our nodes that we've got sitting there listening to the queue will go and accept that and start processing the job and output the videos in the formats that we want. And then once that's done, we sync that back to our file server that we can do all the uploading from or stuff like that. So let's give a demo of actually reviewing a talk. So this is the encoding system. It's very rough around the edges, but it did the job at PyCon and it will get enhanced further. So in this, I have, for example, pulled down the, well, this is actually the system from PyCon. So all of the rooms that you'll see here are the PyCon rooms from last year. So what I've done is taken the Zookeeper output. So Zookeeper is a conference organizing system. We've taken the full schedule from that and parsed it and found all the rooms and then all the talks within that room. So for example, let's go down to the Kennedy room we can go here, we'll see all the talks in that room, and if we select one of them, over the side here we'll get information about that talk. So we can see the schedule ID, the title, the presenter, the start and end time, and the abstract. So if you've ever watched one of these talks on YouTube, you'll find that it's got all of that information there in the description and the title. So we use all of that automatically to upload it. So we need to have all of that for us, the other thing is that when we encode a video, we generate title slides, and all of the title and presenter information from this screen here ends up in that particular video. So someone who is working on the AV team will come along and select the talk, and then they'll go, okay, well, let's look at those videos, and they'll probably actually go and watch a whole lot of the videos themselves because they need to check exactly which ones are the right ones to use. They take them all and they go, okay, so I want this video and so on. Tick which ones they want. And then we've got parameters for them to adjust the start and end time. So imagine all of those videos that are ticked being stitched together into one big long thing. We then want the start time. So we want to say, okay, well, the talk actually starts 10 seconds in, so we'll just trim the first 10 seconds. 
and the end time, well, the recording was finished a little bit late, so we should trim it off. So let's say it was um, five minutes from the end sort of thing. So it will take that information and adjust it appropriately, trimming off the start and end of the talk, so that when we click in code there, it will go and submit that job to the queue for processing. I'm not going to do that now because I don't actually have a full encoding stack and it's not going to do much. So I added a little bit of monitoring in. It's not enough, but it's a good start. So I can see all the jobs that I've actually submitted and I can go and tell it to go off and encode that job again in case it's got stuck in the queue or lost in the queue, which didn't happen, but I'm sure it will at some point. In progress is the worst screen ever. It just takes, for, so this particular setup was using Celery as a queue manager, and I just asked Celery exactly what was in the queue and what was reserved by the different instances, and I shoved the old JSON out, which was good for the last minute uh, monitoring that I needed, but it's not good for anyone else to see, so that needs to be fixed up. And then finally, we've got the output status, which actually is slightly more useful. So we can see the different formats that we needed. So we encoded to MP4 for YouTube, OGV and OG, which will go to Linux Australia Mirror. So we could see in live time what talks were actually encoded so far. And if one of them we found was not quite right, we could hit the button and submit it again so it would go and be encoded. Yes. So I could, well, sometimes we found that the nodes were um, running out of disk space. So we actually had to go in and delete stuff off the file system and then just do it again and it worked. Um, that happened once or twice. There was a little bit of um, actual manu manual editing of the, out the configuration for a talk. So when you go and configure the talk from the screen, it outputs a JSON file with a whole lot of different configuration as you typed in the screen there. Sometimes we went through and just manually changed stuff because that was quickest at the time. Um, so we could submit it again to kick it off. Um, but most of the time, you probably won't need that. Yes? Did you, or did you have a shared NFS drive for the... Um, yep, so... Yes, so the question was about setup of the machines and file servers. So the way we had it at PyCon was that every laptop in the um, venue of ours was hooked up to an AV network. There was a shared NFS drive mounted on all of them. We then, at the end of each night, well, so actually during the day, we were copying the files to that mount point. And then at night, the aim is to review the jobs and actually let them start encoding. The different uh, the encoding nodes would then have um, access to that mount point as well. They'd get a job. They'd know exactly where the mount point is by the configuration on that node. And then they'd pull the um, files down locally because we found that it was quicker to copy them locally and then encode them than it was to encode them by pointing them at the actual NFS mount. So we did that and encoded them, output them, and then copied them back to the um, NFS mount at the end. So I don't especially want to be copying them locally and then encoding them, but that was the fastest we found at that time. So if there's something else we can do to tweak it, then I'm all for that. Buy a, buy a larger NFS server? Potentially, <laughs> yeah. Um, another question. Um, DB switch. So DB switch ends up recording the, or you know, putting onto disk, the mix down of the video. So once, if, if you happen to be three seconds late and the speaker's moved and you need to switch video streams, then you're too late. Yep. Um, have you looked at, in the new system, the possibility of 
recording soft video editing. So you you record at the you re record um, editing metadata and every stream, and then merge them at some point. Yeah. Okay. So one thing, uh, yes, that's true. We haven't at the moment got individual streams. We've just got one output. Um, we would like to get to that point. I'd like to get the whole system working first and then do that. Um, most of that will come down to what Voctomix does. So we'll work with um, CCC to get that how we want it. Um, I'd still like to have a single stream dumped out. Most of the time, that's what we can use. And it's quicker for me to just, if that most of them are right, very rarely have we found that we need to, but there are always cases where we might want to go back and change it. So if we've got that stream as well as the original ones, we can then go and do the post mixing if we need to. So I'd like to get there. The other thing is data storage. Um, at PyCon, we would not have been able to fit all of the data onto our thing. I know we can just go and buy more drives and that'll fix the problem, but we just have to make sure that we're ready for that because I bet that the first time we did it, we'll run out of space because we don't anticipate how much it is. Because one of the things that I've found uh, always rather strange is we have a lot of hardware sponsors for things like Linux conferences, <laughs> Linux conference and other things, and yet we end up with the main server being someone's souped up games machine. <laughs> and you'd think that it would be possible to go to HP or IBM or Rackspace or any number of other people and say, can you lend us a rack? And they'll go, sure, where do you want it delivered? And that would, you know, there's your storage, there's your network, there's your everything already sorted out, so. Yeah, that's certainly something we can look at, but yeah. So going back to this, um, yep, so you've seen how we reviewed it. I sort of touched on what we do in the processing. So we take the output of the um, reviewed um, talk, which is at this point just some JSON, and from that the encoding node will take a job and it will go and do these things. So what it will first do is generate the title slide and the credit slide. So we normally have a static image that we use with the sponsors on and stuff like that, and we overlay that with the text of the presenter's name, the talk name, and whatever else we want. And we generate them out as videos. We then create a pipeline of sorts that has all the different title slides and the videos that you've selected um, and put them all together. And then we go and encode them to the different formats that we want. So the way I've done that in this system using Python is a library called MoviePy. So MoviePy was really good. It exposed some really nice wrappers around FFmpeg. So I could basically just say, OK, here's the first video. Here's the next video. Trim it here and here, and tell it all that information, and then push go. And it would just take all of that and just spit out the video that I want. So rather than having to mess around with getting all the right FFmpeg commands to do all the stuff like that, MoviePy just let me use Python completely. So I didn't touch any FFmpeg stuff at all. There was one little bit of FFmpeg I had to work out, and thanks to Tim, we got it working, which was all of the videos, when they were being encoded, came out the wrong aspect ratio, because somehow FFmpeg was not getting the right information from um, MoviePy, which it, if we ran all the stuff natively, we would have got. So we found the command, stuck it in there, and then it worked. So MoviePy was really good for that because it does have a lot of extensibility. We can write plugins for it as well if we need to, and it is all open source. So I've already gone and fixed a couple of bugs that we ran into, and I don't know if they've been pushed up yet, but they should be soon. So there is still a lot to improve. Um, the UI, as you saw, is pretty rough. It worked fine for what we needed at the conference, but I need to improve that a lot more. The video quality is another thing that I'm not entirely happy with. So we got the videos out, but when you're encoding the videos, there's a big trade-off between how big you want the video to be and how good you want it to be and how big the file will be. 
So if you've got an hour long thing and you've got 11 gigabytes of DV, your DV, I don't want her 11 gigabyte MP4 file at the end, but that's what you get if you don't tell her to change it. So we wanted to cut that down. So we got it down to about, I think it was 20 minutes or 25 minutes or so per video. Um, and that's sort of right, it's not wonderful. Um, the video quality wasn't as good as I hoped, but it was good enough back from the system that we had at that time. But we need to do more tests and work out exactly what options we need to feed it to get the best output possible. We need some more reviewing options. So within those screens you saw before, I could specify a start and end time but there were a few videos that went up after the conference and that was because we needed to go and cut bits out of the middle of them or um, there was one video that somehow had a slight um, problem in it. I'm not sure what it was exactly. A frame was dropped or a disk corruption or something in that. I don't know. But anyway, I could not do it apart from going and manually cutting out three frames of the video and then it worked. Um, so if you ever watch that video, I won't tell you which one it is. There'll be a very slight jump, and hopefully you won't notice it, because it is only three frames. Um, but having the option in the software just to configure it and go, yep, chop here and here, rather than me having to go and use DD as we did in the past to chop out the stuff and then encode it, that would be really nice. So um, yeah, DD was really good. Um, just, yeah. I'm surprised how well DD worked to merge the videos. But I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> um, and finally, integration with other conference systems. So we use Zookeeper for most Linux Australia conferences, and it works pretty well. But I know there are efforts being done at the moment to write a new one. Um, so if that actually happens, well, we need to integrate whatever we've got with that. And I want this to be able to use anywhere, and not everyone's going to have a Zookeeper output stream, so let's make that a module that someone can go and configure it. Yes. So. Um, worth pointing out or mentioning that there's a, if I remember rightly, LCA-video list on the um, Linux org au list server yes that is. is a really good place for which was set up for this kind of discussion of what can you know how can we improve this and you know who's going to do the work and what ideas do we have and so forth yeah so that particular mailing list i don't know if i'm on yet or not but i want to be um, based on the discussions I had over the past week and hopefully this has prompted a whole lot more people to get involved, and that's the place that I'm going to recommend that people go to as well. So thanks for mentioning that. And it leads on very nicely to this slide on how do I get involved. So um, the hardware. So all of the Opsys boards and stuff like that that we're using for the HDMI capturing is done by Tim Ansell. Um, it is all open hardware, so the specs are all up. And if you want to get involved with that, either with coding the firmware for it or actually designing parts of the hardware, check out that website or talk to Tim. I know he really wants help. Um, the number of times I've heard over the last few days, I need more developers. Um, I think that shows just how much he wants more help. As for the software, um, so my version of Event Streamer is in a repo there. And if you're interested in what I've done, you'll want to go to the PyCon branch. But I want to take that further and go and split it up into a bit more of a project. So at the moment, there's one repository with everything in it, which is sort of simple for deployment. But it also means that you can't easily split anything up. So the encoding node, I had to try to rip the encoding part out, which depended on this other bit. And that was sort of difficult. So if we can get it to the point where we've got, <laughs> yes, Leon's been working on it. so. Oh, there we go. It's already split. So I might be able to take that. So um, there's a bit more that needs to be done on my end, and hopefully that'll happen soon. As for the actual mixing, Vokta Mix is up there on GitHub, and it's pretty easy to read. It's all Python um, with the GTK front end. So if you know any of that and are interested, get involved and or talk to one of us as well. 
So I'll open the floor if you've got any questions. I know we've had a few already, but I'm sure there's probably some more based on past experience. It's probably worth noting too that Tim's, like you mentioned, the boards, the Altus board and stuff that you're using, which are basically um, demo boards for the FPGAs that they're using. Yep. Um, and it's worth noting that the long, shortish, medium term plan is to actually do their own board, I think, isn't it? Yes. So Rather than relying on a commercial demo board, they're actually yep. wanting to fab their own board with only the bits on it that they want because those other demo boards being demo boards have a lot of extraneous stuff on it that you don't need to pay for if you don't need to use it. Yes. So in this particular room, we've got an Atlas board, which is one of Tim's prototyping boards. In 211, for example, we've actually got one of these commercially built ones. So Tim did a run at the end of last year and got some of them built. Um, they need a little bit more tweaking yet, by the sounds of it, but they do exist and they'll be only getting better with time. So um, if you're interested in that, yeah, please talk to Tim. I'm not the right person. Tim knows all of it. You do software, he does hardware. Yeah, basically. So you listed the uh, files that you output, which include MP4 and OGV. Yep. Have you considered moving something a bit more modern, like WebM, because OGV is not really that high tech anymore? So we can change to other file formats. We need to make sure that there is definitely an open source file format there. I'm not sure WebM seemed a bit questionable to me last time I looked, but I could be wrong. Um, it's pretty easy with this system to output whatever format I want. Basically, in the um, script, I just say a list of file extensions, and it knows which ones they are and just spits them out. So it should be easy to do that. For PyCon, we only needed those ones, so that's all we did. But yeah, we certainly can look at other formats. Yeah. So if there are no more questions, join with me to uh, thank Joel.